Greetings, friends. In the spirit of the upcoming election, I thought maybe I should do a podcast or two every day leading up to it on whatever topics you'd like to talk about that may be election-related. And thinking of elections, I decided to do a quick rant on a further inspection of election. And what I mean by this is, we in the United States, we're pretty egotistical, we're pretty arrogant. Hey, I count myself amongst the best of them. Uh, and what I want you to understand is that the American election cycle is quite unique on planet Earth, and not because it's a democratic election. Far from it, my friends. Most of the countries on planet Earth now are in the democracy category. Uh, virtually two-thirds of the planet hold something that's the equivalent of elections uh, in different cycles. What's unique about the American election system, though, is how absolutely grotesque it's become with money. Uh, and there are other systems out there that I'd like to challenge you to think about that maybe we need a constitutional amendment to our great United States Constitution to perhaps be in line with places that have better elections. Now, having said that, let's talk about how elections are happening around the world and why I would make fun of the United States election. We'll start at home. Nowhere else on planet Earth do you have the infusion of money so permeate an election cycle like you do here in the United States. We elect a president every four years. Every four years now, for as long as I've been alive, there has been more money spent on said election to the tune of, I don't even know the figures off the top of my head, I don't want to know, millions, a trillion dollars spent to figure out which guy is going to sit in the White House for two years? Who knows? It's grotesque. And no one else on the planet does it quite like this. The other reason I'm not a big fan of this, by the way, is this, is, this gets down to your kind of core beliefs about the... Um, uh, our democracy uh, experiment here in the United States and the role of corporations. The reason this has gotten so out of hand, and not to seem like some left-wing nut, but this is left or right, this is reality. Uh, the reason this has gotten so far out of hand is because our country, the United States of America, has for over a hundred years led the way in deciding and reinforcing this fact for them, uh, which is a corporation equals a human. Now, what has that got to do with the election cycle? Well, it's got everything to do with why the election cycle is so grotesque in our country. Uh, for a hundred years, uh, uh, lawmakers, lawyers, the judiciary, the Supreme Court have all ruled time and time and time and time and time again that a business entity is a human and as a human gets all the rights and privileges accorded to them by the Bill of Rights. Uh, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, political expression. Ah! That's the core of the problem in the United States. When you allow a trillion dollar corporation, when you pretend they're a human and give them all the same rights of a human, they can't vote, but they can politically express themselves. And those with hell tons of money can use that hell tons of money to express themselves louder and more than regular citizens. That's a debate that's been going on in the United States for a while. But it's really now spiraled completely out of control and everybody's just accepted it. That's what's grotesque about it. Everybody's just accepted it. Everybody's like, oh, well, I mean, that's our system. That's the way it has to be because that's the way it is everywhere, right? No! And that's what I want you to understand from this rant. That's not the way it is everywhere else. You do not have unlimited spending basically buying boats everywhere else on the planet. That does not exist. I mean, people can uh, uh, give money to campaigns across the planet, uh, but only in wildly corrupt regimes would you have behavior like this. So if you went anywhere else in the world and said, oh, by the way, I'm going to spend a billion dollars to elect myself, and I'm going to get on TV and spew lies and hatred about the other guy, and I might pad the pockets of political donors by promising them to give them stuff or write laws in their behalf once I get into office, I'm going to spend all the money I can to promise everybody anything and pay off everybody I can. If you do that anywhere else, it's called corruption. <laughs> I mean, sounds like corruption, doesn't it? It smells like corruption. I kind of think it is corruption. But in the United States, we've made it legal, so it's not corruption. We've said, no, 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 for goodness sakes, that's not corruption. We will write some laws written by lawyers who work for corporations 
uh, and passed through a Congress comprised mostly of lawyers and then reinforced by the judiciary, who all used to be lawyers, and all of the lawyers in America have decided this is legal. So corruption everywhere else, perfectly legal here, and thus the grotesque amounts of money uh, infused into this mudslinging, spitfire, nasty ass, completely meaningless uh, election. And by completely meaningless, I don't mean the outcome is meaningless. I mean everything they do, all the hurled insults, and all of the money spent on all of the propaganda, and it's just propaganda. It's all meaningless and worthless. Neither guy is going to do anything that they said they're going to do, and neither guy is really guilty of virtually anything that the other one has said they're guilty of. So it's a total propaganda heyday. Uh, and what is uh, what else is grotesque about the American system is it's like forever. It's perpetuated forever. They started campaigning two freaking years ago. And again, that is not the way the rest of the world behaves. Now, let's speaking of the rest of the world, let's talk about upon further inspection of election, how is it run in other places? Well, in multi-party democracies all over the planet, uh, you do have something, uh, usually a four or five year presidential term. Uh, usually it's uh, uh, two terms. Many democracies have really followed the U.S. model for a lot of kind of the rules, but not all. And I point to a place like Mexico, right next door, who just elected a new president uh, a few months ago. Uh, they have a single six-year term. Uh, there are lots of places around the world that say, no, you can do it once. I kind of like the idea about that. So again, this whole rant is about how should we amend our constitution to make our system better? I like the idea of maybe even a single longer term. At least that way when a president gets into office, he can spend his time doing what he's going to do for the five or six years instead of the perpetual money raising, uh, perpetual campaigning. Barack Obama started campaigning two years after he got into office. What a waste of time for the guy who's supposed to be running the planet. And I'm not making fun of Obama, it's every American president. So other places, do have longer presidential terms. I don't know of any that are shorter than are four years, but some only do one. Uh, and in most uh, multi-party democracies around the planet, there's more than two parties, too. That's something else to consider. It is a growing trend towards two parties. Uh, and I don't know what the, the sick compulsion of humanity is towards two parties. Uh, it's like yin and yang, I guess. It's dark and light. Everybody is a it's very appealing that it's A or B. Don't give me more choices. It's the good guys and the bad guys. That's it. Uh, so two political parties is the way it's supposed to be. No, it's not. No, it's not. Most of the world does not have just two political parties. Most countries, most true blue big democracies have many political parties. Now, I know what maybe some of you are thinking. Oh, we have the Green Party here and the Libertarian Party. No, we don't. All right. They exist, but they, they're not big enough, not supported enough. And, and because our system has become so wildly corrupt with so much money, the, the Green Party, Libertarian Party, hell, the Nazi Party, if there's one in the United States, they have no real voice because they can't afford to be in the propaganda game. They can't afford it. So our compulsion towards spending trillions of dollars on this nonsense is actually making the system less democratic. Because, for those of you that say, oh, well, but you could raise, the Green Party could raise money on their own. Not, not the kind of money we're talking about. You're talking about two well-established ruling houses. And that's what I call the Republicans and Democrats in our country anymore. They're ruling houses. We're basically a democratic monarchy, is what I say. They're, you know, it's the Oranges and the, the Jacobites, or whoever the hell it is in English, uh, the old English system. Two royal houses that have all this money and all this power, and then... I call it a democratic monarchy because we get to choose which king we want. But that's really what we're kind of looking at in today's world. No other political parties can break into this system because the two main houses, the ruling houses, would work against that. Uh, and the smaller parties couldn't afford advertising. Hell, they can't even afford to get into the debates. And they're ignored when they are. I mean, it's really kind of getting to be a really jaded take on democracy, the American experiment with it. So other places in the world that are democracies, more than two parties, which makes for a bit more lively debate, because again, I think it's bizarre that we gravitate towards two political parties as if there's only two choices in life for everything. 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 
Everything economic, political, social uh, values, everything, it's A or B, black or white. Of course not. That's nonsense. I, I long for a viable third party in this country, if for nothing else, to scare the living shit out of the two ruling houses, which know they have a lock on power and therefore have a vested interest in the system not changing at all. But anyway, I was going to go to the rest of the world. Uh, other multi-party democracies usually have much more lively debate, uh, are much more spirited because there's more than one option, and it's almost uh, uh, like the uh, uh, a Mexican standoff. I love the term Mexican standoff. It's going to be in the next Plaid Adventure comic if we get the money to get that funded. A Mexican standoff is when you have three or more, but usually three, armed people in a shootout. Now, in a standard shootout, as is mostly the two-party system in America and other countries that have just two political parties, in a shootout, the advantage is to whoever's the fastest. The fastest gun. If me and you are facing off and we're going to shoot each other, whoever's the fastest wins, if your aim is good, too. Uh, in political terms, whoever has the most money wins. All right. Uh, in a Mexican standoff, there's three parties. Three people with guns in a shootout. Think of the good, the bad, and the ugly. In this particular situation, actually, it's not the person that draws first that wins. It's the person that draws second. Now, why would that be? Because the person that draws first in a Mexican standoff is dedicated. He's pointing at somebody to shoot. The second person now actually has more options. He can opt. The sh he sees what the first person's doing. He can now opt to go and shoot the other guy or this guy. So actually, the advantage is for the person who is second and looking at the bigger picture of what's going on here. And that's what I'm uh, likening to most political debate in other parts of the democratic world. Political parties uh, in a three or four or five party system have to consider other values. They have to consider other sides and they have to figure out how to manipulate either public opinion or work with other political parties in order to win. And that is the case in most multi-party democracies. And I'll pick on one in particular and teach a little bit about what a prime minister is. Because in the Western Hemisphere, that is our side of the earth, we're mostly straight up, good old fashioned democracy. We vote directly for our president or our leader. Most of South America, North America, and all the Americas in between, uh, and many other countries in Africa and other places are kind of standard democracies, representative democracies. You have other places like, say, Great Britain, India, Australia, Japan, which are parliamentary democracies. And for those of you who take my class, sorry if I'm being redundant here, uh, but they're pretty cool. Uh, parliamentary democracies, they do not vote directly for the leader in charge, the president or prime minister, okay? Why is that maybe a good system? And again, I'm challenging you. I actually think we should have a prime minister ship in our country. I like the idea of voting for the president, but at this point, it's to me a waste of time because it's the two royal houses and I don't like either house. So what's the advantage of a prime minister position? Well, prime ministers are not directly voted for. The, whoever is the prime minister is the ruler or the head of the ruling party of the parliament. Consider parliament like Congress. So whatever political party controls the Parliament of the United Kingdom, they get to choose who the leader is. Right this second, it's Prime Minister David Cameron because his political party is in charge of Parliament. But hold on. Oh, contraire, mon frere. No, it's not. Uh, and it's not because Great Britain, right this second, is in more of a multi-party democracy situation. That is, it, it's usually just two main political parties. But they have a third and actually kind of a fourth viable party right now throwing the mix into the fray. So no single political party in Great Britain has the majority of parliament. And because they don't have them, if they had an outright majority, say if the Republicans or the Tories had an outright majority of the parliament, then they could just choose who the prime minister would be. They say, well, we're in charge, so the prime minister is going to be this guy or this lady, Margaret Thatcher. But... Because it's split, because say the Tories only have 40% and the Labour has 40% and these other guys, Libertarians, have 20%, nobody has a clear majority. So what they have to do is form a coalition. They have to form a coalition, a bonding together with another political party. In this case, they say, oh, okay, hey, we're the Tories and you're the Liberal Democrats. 
hey, can we work together? Will you agree to support us so that we're in charge of the parliament and we put our person up uh, as prime minister? And if you partner up with us in forming the government, you may hear it referenced, then we'll work with you on some of your issues. Hey, you know what this is called? This is called politics. This is called working together. This is called cooperation. Something which the United States has lost. Gone. Finished. Why? Because of the grotesque nature of the two-party entrenched ruling house system that is infiltrated with hell tons of money and it, with a vested interest by all these crooks to keep it the same. They can't do that in Great Britain. I mean, I guess they could try, but right this second they can't because no political party outright controls, and so they have to work together. That's why we need a third party in our country as well, to force people back to the table again to behave like, oh, I don't know, what do you call it, adults and politicians and actually have to debate and work together for the betterment of the country? They ain't done that for years, maybe decades. So I like the parliamentary system, and it works better, I think, uh, if you have more than two political parties. I think it's more like democracy when you have more voices in there, but call me crazy. Uh, and the reason I'm talking about stuff like this, oh, by the way, uh, most of these systems that are parliamentary systems that have a prime minister, most of them, not all of them, but most of them, or old British colonies. Surprise, surprise. The Brits exported their political systems. So the major countries that have prime ministers, India, Great Britain, Japan picked up that model, so they have a prime minister as well. Uh, I'm trying to think who else around the world. Uh, those are the major ones, though. Uh, you will see that uh, Vladimir Putin used to be the prime minister of Russia. Now Dmitry Medvedev is the prime minister of Russia. But actually, they're more like a representative democracy like the United States. They directly elect their leader as well. Which leads me to Russia and then China. One of the trends on the planet is, even though most countries on Earth are something close to a representative democracy, uh, there are those countries like Russia that it's forming back into something we call a one-party state. Uh, and that is, they have political parties uh, and they have elections. But Vladimir Putin and his party won Russia are so overwhelmingly popular and so overwhelmingly powerful that really it's a waste of time for anybody to run against them. It's kind of like the American system taken to an extreme where there's two great big ruling houses in the American system which control everything and no one else has a voice. Uh, combine that into one. <laughs> and that's a one-party political system in Russia. A one-party state is what it's leaning back towards. We're, and at that point, we're saying, uh, that doesn't look very democratic at all. If only one group has their opinion expressed all the time and they control all the cards, that's not so democratic. For years, the United States has accused Venezuela of being that under Hugo Chavez. But, to his credit, they have direct uh, elections down there as well, and he has, in free and fair elections, won every time. So his political party is very powerful, but they had just had an election a couple months ago, and it was as close as it's been for a while. So Venezuela is actually going the opposite direction. It's been kind of a one-party state, controlled mostly by Hugo Chavez and his crew, but... They had just had the toughest election of their run for a decade and a half, and so Venezuela is turning back into a multi-party state with viable options. Russia's going the opposite way. They used to have several political parties, and under Vladimir Putin's popularity and fame, it's been consolidated into kind of one political party controls everything. Now let's finish with an absolute extreme. Because, by the way, this is a big election year. Not just in America, blah, 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 these two guys, Obama mittens, whoever's going to win, doesn't matter to me. Uh, but it's a big election cycle all over the planet. I just told you Hugo won. Uh, uh, Vladimir uh, won again this year, and he's in for another 6 to 12 years because they changed their term from uh, 4 years to 6. So he's in for 6. Uh, but other big important leaders are turning over as well, and that would end with China. Now, China, of course, ain't nothing close to no democracy. China rich, but they ain't no democracy. Uh, and they are doing their ritualistic, Communist Party gets together once every five years to decide, just decide, who's going to be in charge. This, in today's world, it's not democratic. I can't support it because it's not democratic, but damn it, it sounds so appealing. I'm sorry, I love democracy and I love America, but boy, the Chinese system just sounds so appealing. 
especially after having suffered through the American atrocity of an election cycle for the last year and a half. So what's the Chinese system? Well, they make no pretensions of being a democracy at all. They're not. They're a one-party state, too. The one political party is the Communist Party. And the Communist Party holds all the cards and all the positions of government. It is a political party, though, because uh, China, for those of you who've taken my class, you know, China's not a communist state. They ain't a communist economy. They ain't communist nothing. But they have a political party that's called communist. That's about as far as it goes. And you have to be a card-carrying member of the communist party in order to hold public office. And so there are commies in the local, you know, sub-states, and there are like commie governors in all the states, and commie legislatures in all the states. Uh, but if you looked at China as a whole, and someone can uh, wiki fa fact check me here, of the 1.4 or 1.5 billion Chinese people, I think only 2% of them are card-carrying communists in the Communist Political Party and therefore office holders. I could be wrong on that. Uh, but 2% of 1.4 billion is actually a hell ton of people. So you have to be in the political party, the one political party, in order to hold office. And what they do every five years is... Uh, all the regional governors or whatever the hell their titles are all get together in the big kind of communist hoedown fun times there in Beijing. The Central Committee is what it's called. So the Communist Central Committee gets together with representatives from around the uh, country and they just sit down behind closed doors and say, okay, who's next? Who's next? Uh, Hu Jintao and Wen Jiabao, they had a good run. Should we allow them for another five-year run or should we replace them with somebody else? I was informed by this uh, by some Chinese students in class last week, and I always love picking up the insider information, that uh, China's leaders basically have a five-year term, a renewable twice. Uh, and it's very rare that they only serve one term unless they really suck, really screw up. So Hu Jintao and Wen Jiabao went in 10 years ago. Uh, the Central Committee got together and said, hey, here's our two guys. They look good. Go for it. They did so well the first five years that when the Central Committee got together again five years ago, that everybody was like, yes, they're staying in. That's fine. Party time in Beijing and we're done. And now, though, they have a two-term limit. Again, Chinese people told me this. There's a two-term limit there. So Hu Jintao and Wen Jiabao, even though they're beloved and have done an awesome job, it's time for them to go. They're going to go. Uh, and the Central Committee will pick who's going to replace them. We all know it's probably 99.9% .9 sure uh, Xi Jinping. But they will make that determination and then for the next several, I don't know, five to six months, make the moves to start moving titles away from Hu Jintao and giving those titles to uh, Xi Jinping. Uh, titles like head of the military, uh, head of maybe central intelligence, uh, head of the... They'll be shifting title by title to reinforce that Xi, uh, Xi is taking over and then they'll have some big ceremony probably next summer to make it official. That's how it works in China. Now, not democracy. No, 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 no. But boy, isn't it tidy and clean and nice, and no one spent a trillion dollars and bashed each other to do it. But again, it's not democracy. I can't support that. Let me just kind of conclude by saying, think about these different systems. Think about how we can make a better America. Don't be so tied to this idea that the Founding Fathers wrote this document 200 years ago that can never, ever, ever be altered. Of course it can. We've had many amendments to the Constitution. Maybe it's time for another amendment. Maybe it's time that we took power back from these two ruling houses uh, that have it in their vested interest to keep things the way they are forever because they have the power. I think we need to bring the power back to the people with a constitutional amendment. Maybe a term limit for the president. Maybe a longer term, but a single one. Maybe we shift to a parliamentary system. Maybe we make an amendment that says the pre whoever gets elected president, the vice president, has to be from the opposite political party. I think that's the way it used to be in America. Somebody fact check me on that as well. So if we can't get the money out of the system, why don't we, because the lawyers control everything, why don't we think about changing the system? We can do that. It's a democracy. We can make a referendum happen in this country. So um, that's what I wanted to end on. This grotesque amount of money, how it's altered and changed the American political landscape, I think for the worse for America, and how it is quite unique, this grotesque amount of money which has been made legal, therefore it's not corrupt. Uh, other countries, and again, one of the reasons I like the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, prime ministership parliamentary system is that when they call election, it's two months, baby. Two months. That's it. Nobody's spending money before that. There's no shit on television. You're not getting inundated with flyers in your mailbox. Two months, they say. Oh, by the way, uh, looks like it's time for a general election. We're not sure if the leadership's going to stay the same. We're not sure who's going to be in charge of parliament. 
Call for general election, going to happen in two months, two months, go. And I think they probably have caps on spending as well, but even if they didn't, who cares? It's only two months. Can't we adopt something, some elements of other systems from other parts of the planet? I think the Founding Fathers would like the idea that we're not a stagnant nation, that we use the heritage, tradition, and awesomeness of the Constitution, but then manipulate it and tweak it as the times change to make our country better. Not to keep it exactly the same damn way it was 200 years ago. That's preposterous. That's why they built in the amendment system, for goodness sakes. And it's time to pull back political power to the peoples in this country that is by the people, for the people, comprised of the people, and the people need to take the power back. Let me know what you think about this pre-election rant and what you'd like to hear about tomorrow on the eve of the big grotesque overpaid election. But for now, party on, political pundits and friends.